Dobry Dien Minsk, Dobry Dien Washington, Vitaim Voss Atlantic Council. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Melinda Herring, and I am the Deputy Director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. We are so delighted to welcome you to the latest edition of Atlantic Council Front Page, our live ideas platform highlighting global leaders who are making a difference in the world. Last August, we started a Belarus initiative to highlight the political unrest there after Alexander Lukashenko stole the presidential election. Lukashenko has presided over the country since 1994. Let me cut to the chase. It's a scary police state. Last year, he called an election and he expected an easy victory. Boy, was he wrong. Lukashenko bungled the response to COVID and a grassroots civil society movement organized and demanded new leadership. That new leadership is here today. The Atlantic Council has developed a close and enduring relationship with the legitimate leader of those elections, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya and her team. We are honored to host her here today. Before August of last year, she wasn't political and she was raising two lovely children. Svetlana never sought high office, but she had to jump in to try to make life better for her children and for all the people of Belarus. Grit, determination, and a greater calling drive this woman. Welcome, Svetlana. We admire your courage, your conviction, and the sacrifice you have made for Belarus and the example that you set for the world. We remember your husband, Sergei, your partner, Maria, and the hundreds of political prisoners behind bars. We pray that they soon will walk in freedom, and we pray that the people of Belarus will soon walk in freedom as well. Before I turn things over to Amna Nawaz, Chief Correspondent of PBS NewsHour, to moderate today's discussion, I would like to turn to U.S. Ambassador to Belarus, Julie Fisher, for opening remarks. Ambassador Fisher, the floor is yours. Thanks, Melinda, and thanks very much to the Atlantic Council Eurasia team. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Madam Sikhanovskaya and Amna. This week marks an important step in the United States' relationship with Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, the Coordination Council, and the movement that she leads. Her reception in Washington is indicative of the importance the United States and our partners place on supporting democracy and respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms in Belarus. The past two weeks illustrated in the starkest terms, the challenges facing the women and men striving to make the dream of a sovereign, independent, democratic Belarus a reality. The regime's ruthless crackdown on more than 30 NGOs and media outlets reveals its deep insecurities in the face of independent voices. For over a year now, Svetlana Tsikhanouskaya has selflessly led the democratic movement as it bravely defies Europe's last dictator at great personal risk and cost. That's why we're here today to discuss how we in the United States can do more in support of her, her team, the Coordination Council, and all those working towards a more promising future that serves the people of Belarus. As the geographically challenged ambassador to Belarus, I can say the United States will continue to do its utmost to support you, Ms. Tsikhanouskaya, in that endeavor. I'd highlight a few key areas of effort already on the books. In concert with key European partners and with special recognition of the leading roles of Poland and Lithuania, we have worked to build a broad coalition of like-minded governments, civil society representatives, and Belarusians in exile. At the OSCE and at the United Nations, we have launched fact-finding missions into human rights abuses. At ICAO, we are focused on getting to the facts surrounding the forced diversion of Ryanair Flight 4978. And with partners like the EU, the United Kingdom, and Canada, we continue to coordinate tools of economic pressure in support of the Belarusian people and to hold regime actors accountable for their abuses. Moreover, in recognition of the daily struggle happening on the ground, we have expanded our assistance to the people of Belarus. That includes emergency support to civil society leaders and sustainment of grassroots voices within Belarus, including independent media. Ultimately, what we see are two competing visions for the future of Belarus. One that forces the people of Belarus to live subject to the whims of a corrupt and self-serving leader, frozen in time and increasingly isolated from the rest of the world. And the other, one that envisions a Belarus in which fundamental freedoms and human rights are respected and the will of the people is honored through free and fair elections under international observation 
and one in which the state serves the people, not the other way around. I appreciate the opportunity to join you today. I'm very much looking forward to this discussion. Over to you, Amna. introduction. Welcome to all of you out there joining us from wherever you are in our online audience. Welcome to our audience here in the room and a special welcome to our special guest, Svetlana Tsikonuskaya. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to Washington. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here. Um, as you know, you and I will be in conversation for a few minutes and we will be opening up the floor for audience questions. So if you have those, please feel free to submit them. We'll get to them at the end of the conversation. Um, meanwhile, before we get into politics and policy and uh, the conversations you're having here in Washington, I would love to start with you. <laughs> because as Melinda mentioned, it's a very different life you're leading right now mm -hmm. than you were leading a year ago. You were a former English teacher, a stay-at-home mother. It's been almost a year now since your husband was jailed. You fled the country under threat with your children. You've been living in Lithuania. What is this moment like for you? How are you processing the stress and the weight of this moment? Well, of course, uh, I understand how difficult uh, our path is, but I don't really have to concentrate uh, on how difficult it is to me personally, because uh, those people who are on the ground, uh, those people whose relatives uh, are in jail, who have children, uh, they have difficult lives. They uh, have to take care about uh, their children. They have to take care about relatives. I also have to, but I, at least I hope that I'm uh, in safeness in another country. But those who are uh, on the ground, they are under attack all the time. They can be uh, jailed at any moment. They have to settle all their uh, all the, uh, you know, uh, home deals, you know, they have to know in the case they are jailed, uh, whom uh, the children will be with, who will take care uh, of uh, their old parents, for example, who will, uh, with whom they will leave their dog and uh, all this stuff. You know, it's extremely, uh, it's much, much more dangerous to uh, stay in Belarus now. Uh, but, you know, I, it's, it's difficult for me as well because I have uh, to study a lot. I have to, uh, I have to have, uh, you know, these visits without a uh, huge experience. And uh, what is uh, more important, I uh, feel this responsibility. This is very difficult to understand that uh, people uh, rely on you, uh, rely on your communication with the other uh, leaders and uh, uh, people expect and help from uh, Western countries, from democratic countries. And you're like, uh, on behalf of Belarusian people, you have right to talk to those people. It's your task to uh, update information about Belarus, to uh, show the pain of uh, Belarusian people at the moment, to persuade them to uh, take more efforts, to be braver, to be stronger in their actions uh, against the regime. So this is difficult. Their responsibility is difficult. But uh, physically um, and emotionally, people who are on the ground are under huge attack. You are now representing all of those people. You are now the face, the global face, the global leader of that democratic movement looking to bring down the man known as Europe's last dictator. Did you think that you would be here a year ago? Oh, of course not. You know, I've never been involved in politics the same as the majority of Belarusians. We never... Um, I almost never believed that something could be done. But last year, uh, step by step, many, many actions like uh, preceded this up uh, awakening of uh, Belarusian people. You know, new faces started to, uh, to appear in Belarus, like my husband, Sergei uh, Tikhanovsky, he started to go around to the country asking uh, ordinary people, how do you live? Uh, what do you, would you like to change? And he became a threat to the regime. You know, he became very vocal, became uh, rather famous, and he rose people up, you know, you are wonderful people. Why do we have to live uh, under the dictatorship? We need to change uh, something. And then COVID came and uh, people uh, understood that they can deal without uh, uh, this government. We, uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the time when uh, 
uh, our doctors, medics waited help from government. Uh, it didn't help to them and people united to supply our uh, doctors with the uh, facial mask, with specialist equipment for breathing. And, uh, you know, people understood that this is solidarity. This is, uh, we, we can survive without this dictator. Then uh, after election, after elections were declared, uh, uh, Victor uh, Babalika appeared on the scene and, uh, you know, uh, uh, it was a different type of leader. It, he wasn't a politician. Valeri Tsipkala also wasn't a politician and uh, people saw alternative. And, uh, you know, uh, and I, I was like nearby my husband. I followed him. I followed the process but I wasn't involved in politics. And of course, I couldn't imagine that I will be here uh, at this place uh, in a year because I brought my documents to election commission only you know, to support my husband. And I was sure that the election commission would deny uh, to accept my documents because they understood that I'm wife of uh, Sergei, but you know, uh, they wanted to make love at me you know, and uh, just look who will vote for a woman, for housewife, you know, but they lost this connection with people in Belarus. They lost understanding that people woke up that they don't want to live un under dictatorship anymore and new people on the political arena appeared uh, and uh, they, they lost this the moment, you know. Where is the movement today on the ground? Because we all remember last year, hundreds of thousands of people taking to the streets, the brutal state crackdown in response. It's fair to say the protests have become much more muted since then. So is the enthusiasm gone? Has Lukashenko won? Uh, you know, picture disappeared, not protest. Because uh, when with the help of violence and guns, uh, regime succeeded to uh, suppress uh, people on the, uh, on the streets, uh, of course, uh, people went to fight uh, uh, on underground level. It's impossible to, with the help of violence and tortures and these repressions to change minds of people. And uh, people are continuing to fight, though we can't uh, go out so massively as uh, it happened uh, after prudent elections. Though people, and this is bravery, when you are under attack, you are under repressions, but you are continuing to fight. You People understand that they can be detained any moment. You can be kidnapped uh, on the street just because of the color of your socks or maybe because you uh, participated in peaceful demonstrations um, uh, in August, September, October. But you are going out and do something. You are widespread in uh, newspapers, self-made newspapers. You are joining uh, different initiatives. You are, if you're a worker, you are joining um, striking committee. So you're trying to do very small step, but it's already a step. But we are nine millions, and this is already will be nine millions of steps. And uh, it is difficult, people are scared, uh, but uh, they continue to fight. And that's why, you know, uh, on my meetings, I urge countries don't lead um, picture-based policy, but lead values-based policy. It's don't don't think that if you don't see the, those huge demonstrations, uh, people uh, lost intention uh, for changes. Of course, not processes are going on. They are not evident. Uh, moreover, uh, mass media was destroyed in Belarus, and we can't get um, you know uh, shots from from Belarus. But we are trying hard. But let me ask you about some of the support on the ground, because there was this analysis from Chatham House earlier this year that, that looked at what Belarusian people feel in this moment. Um, and there was very strong support for the democratic movement among a core base, about 37% said they fully support the democratic movement, but then 45%. 45% of those surveys said that they are tired of Lukashenko, but that they don't feel that the democratic movement represents their interests. That's a significant number of people. So I wonder, can you move forward with this effort without their support? And if you don't have it now, how do you get it? Uh, you know, I really um, don't think that uh, these numbers uh, are correct because uh, I'm sure that the majority of those people understand that uh, uh, with change of the regime on uh, uh, after the democratic change in, in our country, we uh, will 
we will start to live much better emotionally. We will feel safe. And when new president come to, uh, to rule in our country and he will take care, first of all, of people, so we will live much better. You know, our people, Belarusians, have never experienced what democracy is. The majority of people even, you know, don't know. They, they, they see democracy in other countries, but they never... Uh, felt this in 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 Belarus, so it's uh, difficult for uh, them to imagine how it is, you know, to be free, uh, to speak freely, to be responsible for uh, the future of your country, and uh, it's necessary to study what democracy is, you know, to, you know and uh, it's a long way, uh, but I'm sure that uh, a majority of people uh, would like to change everything. Well, let me ask you about um, some of the support Lukashenko has right now, because the West is united in their refusal to uh, to recognize him as a legitimate leader, but Russian President Vladimir Putin has certainly backed him. How crucial is Moscow's support to Lukashenko staying in power? And what do you think that Moscow wants in Belarus? No, uh, Putin, uh, you supported Lukashenko after fraudulent elections because Kremlin also didn't expect such a prison of uh, Belarusian people. And, uh, you know, Kremlin uh, continued uh, the policy of supporting regime, supporting tortures. And it's it's very pity because we are um, really have wonderful relationship with uh, Russian people. And Lukashenko is not... Uh, the whole Belarus, it's only one person. And they can make their friendship even, you know, after changes. But uh, now we don't see clear strategy of uh, uh, Russia uh, on Belarus. And, you know, I have a question, why uh, at all we are talking about Russia in this case? This is not uh, the fight between uh, West or East, you know, it's uh, our fight is between past and the future. This is, uh, fight inside our country. This is uh, for uh, bringing to people uh, they right to choose whoever, whoever they want. For sure, Russia will be our neighbors uh, in the future, and we will have to uh, have relationship with uh, them. But our country is in crisis, and if Russia wants to play a constructive role in getting out of this crisis, so just don't interfere into uh, in the policy of our country. And uh, no, that's it. But if I can follow up on that, I think it's fair to say Belarus would find itself increasingly in the crossfire of uh, of a growingly zero sum competition between Russia and the West. So we've seen happen with other nations as well. So I'm curious how you would navigate that. I mean, can you see Belarus going through a democratic revolution and still maintaining close ties to Russia? No, we want to. Uh build neutral countries, uh, neutral country that will uh, look for allies, not for enemies. And I'm sure that a uh, new president will be wonderful manager in Belarus, and he will be able to build uh, good relationships with neighboring countries, with the East and West, maybe step by step, not immediately, but it is possible. When you say the new president of Belarus, I should clarify, would you like to be the new president of Belarus? I'm not going to participate in new elections. Uh, you know, first of all, I have mandate only to bring, uh, together with all Belarusians, to bring our country to new elections. Uh, but I uh, never wanted to um, be in the power, I never wanted to participate. And, uh, you know, it's a pity to say that now, Mm, Lukashenko's uh, regime is destroying our economy, destroying everything, uh, uh, organizations, businesses in Belarus, and uh, we really will need a strong manager. And uh, I'm sure that there are people in Belarus, uh, some are in prison, mm, some maybe will appear, who uh, will have difficult times after elections, And we, but uh, for sure we will choose a wonderful person to rule our country. I'd love to ask about your meetings here in Washington as well. Yesterday, you met with uh, U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. You came out of that meeting and you said that you understand there will be, quote unquote, strong actions taken very soon. So did you request additional sanctions? We, of course, we are talking about sanctions uh, because we understand that um, only sanctions now 
and uh, fight inside country and sanctions outside the country could uh, influence uh, on the behavior of this regime and make them to stop repressions, uh, release political prisoners and start dialogue with civil society. And we uh, talked about uh, sectoral sanctions because they are most powerful. They uh, would hit on uh, uh, the enterprises that are um, belong to Lukashenko's cronies, Lukashenko's wallets. Uh, they they monopolized, uh, you know, uh, potash, oil, steel, and wood enterprises in Belarus. And the sectoral sanctions will will um, put heat on on uh, uh, on uh, the regime. And um, we uh, talked about uh, widening the list of personal sanctions uh, because we uh, there are so many um, people who. Uh, made crimes, committed crimes against Belarusians, like KGB people, like judges who uh, sentenced people to years uh, of prison and f just for nothing. And uh, propagandists, uh, you know, Lukashenko's cronies, police people, you know, and all this stuff. And uh, the USA uh, has opportunity to put, you know, thousands of people in this uh, sanction list. And did they commit to you that they would take those steps? Uh, they will uh, take all the efforts to uh, do everything possible uh, to impose those sanctions. What else did you request in the way of support from U.S. administration officials? Financial support, security support? Uh, yeah, we uh, talked about investigation of corruption schemes in Belarus, like uh, secret smuggling, like human trafficking. And um, this is what uh, is for uh, pressure on the regime. But uh, on the other hand, of course, we understand to make um, civil society sustainable, uh, we need uh, a lot of uh, technical financial assistance to people. First of all, to people who are staying in Belarus, who are building uh, institutions, their organizations, and uh, to political prisoners, to relatives of political prisoners, and uh, but of, it's important to also to support um, mass media that have been destroyed on the ground, but they relocated to other countries. They continue their work, and they need uh, investments because so many people uh, uh, have been fired because of uh, this destroying. And uh, uh, you know, it's so much expenses uh, at the moment. You know, you know, to promote your messages, to um, uh, to shoot videos about Belarus, it's, it's a mass media task. And of course, for usual relicants, for usual people and families who uh, were running from repressions in Belarus and uh, you know have to settle down somehow, you know the cost of uh, evolution for people is very high, mm -hmm. and uh, Belarusians are modest people, but uh, we need uh, to ask uh, for this help to survive, to um, build the sustainable society, and. Uh, that's why we are sure that such um, assistance should be uh, much higher than uh, it is supplied now. But anyway, you know, we for many years we get uh, assistance from uh, the USA uh, through USA ID, through NED, uh, IRI, uh, Freedom House. Uh, Atlantic Council, you know, all the organizations, and you are very, they're very supportive now, but, um, you know, macro, macro help should be, uh, should be increased. And of course, we talked about the future of Belarus. We mm -hmm. are in the process of revolution, but we see how uh, everything is being destroyed by this regime, and we will uh, have to, new, new president will have to restore everything. And we, at the beginning, after new elections, we will need um, shoulder of strong countries. Uh, and, uh, you know, the European Union already launched a um, uh, comprehensive plan for Belarus. It's uh, assistance, uh, financial assistance for first years. And if uh, uh, they say would be able to launch so-called Marshall Plan for Belarus, so it would be of uh, um, uh, great importance for us as for message that you, we have alternative for those businesses who are beside Lukashenko now, but they understand that he's uh, he's over. And when we uh, offer them good alternatives for continuing their businesses in future new Belarus, so they would uh, they would make the choice.
You haven't yet met with President Biden, though. Have you asked to? Sorry? President Biden. You haven't met with him yet, no, have I you? No, I haven't. Have you requested that meeting? Uh, yeah, would, we would like, of course, to meet with uh, President Biden. Uh, it wasn't scheduled, but uh, just maybe by chance we'll be able to meet him. And uh, But I'm sure, you know, we had and will have meetings on the highest level in, in the USA, and we are grateful for such opportunity. And I'm sure that uh, President Biden is extremely in interested in uh, Belarus because uh, at the beginning of his presidency, he declared that... Uh, the world now is struggling uh, in uh, bet between autocracy and democracy, and uh, the USA is going to widespread democratic values all over the world. And so as Belarus now uh, at the front line of uh, this fight, it's like moral obligation uh, of the USA to uh, make commitment to support Belarus. So I'm sure he uh, knows uh, the situation and his uh, uh, you know, his assistants, uh, you know, his uh, diplomats are uh, telling him all everything about our meetings. But can I ask in these meetings, in these conversations, what is the case that you're making to them about why now? Because the U.S. could wait. They could watch the sanctions take hold. They could see Lukashenko's power chip away at the moment. You are right now stuck outside the country, and the movement on the ground has really lost a lot of momentum because of the brutal state crackdown. So what's the case that you make to the United States about why they should back you and why now? No, I really don't uh, ask uh, to back me. I ask to back democratic values. This is what understandable for America. We are sharing now uh, common values like rule of law, human rights, um, uh, democracy, and stand for this. No, the fight now, the cases that fight now in Belarus, in the locally, but it's, uh, it's uh, the problem of the whole world now. So be with us because we are sharing your values. We are fighting. We uh, we are glad that uh, the USA is the biggest democracy. You are living in this, but there are countries that uh, are on their path to, democ to democracy. So uh, be with values. What is it you'd like to see from the Biden administration in the way of foreign policy? You mentioned the additional sanctions that you've requested. Is it a campaign of maximum pressure that you'd like to see? Uh, maximum pressure, maximum support uh, to civil society in Belarus, uh, support those initiatives that are um, uh, collecting evidences of crimes uh, in Belarus and investigating them, and uh, send clear messages to all the countries that uh, uh, could use weakness uh, of regime now uh, in their advantage and uh, Send clear message that we are going to that independence independence for Belarus is the highest value, and uh, uh, surrender Belarus is not for trade. Nobody can nobody can um, understand any deals with Lukashenko at the moment because he's uh, illegitimate, and uh, those deals uh, will not be recognized in the future. He may be illegitimate, but I have to ask you about his the strength of his regime right now, because it's fair to say he still has the support of the security services, right, the military and the intelligence. Um, it was just a few months ago, he forced down a commercial plane to take off a, a blogger that he didn't like and detain him. Uh, and he's now cracked down brutally on independent media um, and journalists, as you, as you mentioned earlier. Doesn't all of that say to you that he actually still enjoys a lot of support on the ground? Mm. He doesn't have uh, a lot of support. Um, he can influence uh, uh, the people through fear uh, and blackmailing people. I think that the majority of uh, uh, people in the regime are like, can I say, on the hook, hooked by him and a lot of people uh, in the regime, especially, you know, KGB, their uh, hands are in blood already. And, uh, you know, he's uh, manipulated by these people. They feel like, like uh, you know, one a system. But uh, usual um, uh, workers in this regime, in nomenclatura, in ministries, they all they want changes. They are scared, they're feared for their families, of course, it's, it's normally. And they... 
they're not supporting uh, him, but they have to walk there. You know how many times you know, people told us then uh, when they were um, jailed by policemen and, you know, they um, uh, feel these papers and uh, say, policemen say, I'm supporting you, I'm with you, but I have to do my job. You know, this is, uh, uh, of course, we would like them to, um, uh, to say the strong words that we are with not Lukashenko, but sometimes, uh, you know, people can't uh, overstep their fears. And... Uh, People of the regime, people who are inside the regime, sometimes they are even more uh, slaves of this uh, regime than usual people are, and they are more scared. They, uh, but uh, we we got a lot of information, inside information from uh, from KGB and red police, you know, video, audio recordings. There are people uh, who continue to fight secretly. We don't say uh, to them, you know. Uh, uh, go, get out of the regime, stay there, but be with us, work with us, give us There are people within the regime, you're saying, uh, yeah, who are supporting yeah. you and yes. working to undermine Lukashenko Absolutely. right now. Within his security services as well? Yeah. And you believe that will help to ultimately end the regime? Of course. Can I ask you one last question yeah. before we turn to the audience on this? Your husband it remains one of the hundreds of people, uh, political prisoners, who are detained. Do you talk to him? Are you in contact with him? How is he doing? Uh, in in Belarus, uh, people don't have opportunity to communicate directly to their relatives. Uh, they can't uh, phone them. The only way of communication is through the lawyers who have come to visit uh, prisoner with a message and print message back, and of course paper letters. No other ways to for communication. And you no, know, he is uh, Sergei is very strong person. And uh, he is having his closed trial now, not even in the court, but in prison. And the regime is so afraid of uh, uh, that people will see uh, those uh, unbroken um, so-called prisoners that uh, they don't want to show uh, this trial to the people. And uh, you know, but all those people who are behind the bars. Uh, Viktor Babalika, Masha Kolesnikova, Sergei, Igor Losik, uh, Nikolai Statkevich, so many people behind the bus, but they didn't uh, get any deals with Lukashenko. They understood, they understand uh, that they are innocent people. They, they only so-called guilt is that uh, they wanted to print changes, democratic changes to Belarus to um, uh, fight for safeness of people, for better life, and uh, now they are political prisoners. And our task uh, in Belarus, our responsibility, um, responsibility of democratic countries to make everything possible, uh, to release uh, all of them as soon as possible. And I ask uh, all the countries, and the UC in particular, to be braver. The same as uh, Belarusian people are brave, despite of uh, uh, repressions, despite of violence, they are continuing to be brave. I'd love to turn to some audience questions now, if you don't mind. We have one here from Mix, from Latvia, uh, from an organization called Make Room. Um, he writes, the biggest challenge, as many have stated, no dictator will leave voluntarily. The dictator has to be taken down. First part of the question is, do you agree with this? And the second part is, what can people outside and inside Belarus do to fasten, I think he means to, to hasten the process of the dictator leaving his self-appointed chair and hold new fair democratic elections? Uh, yeah, and you know, I think that the whole world has to um, fight with uh, dictatorship in different countries uh, because um, it's very dangerous, it's very dangerous. And uh, we see that how, um, for example, Belarusian uh, uh, dictator regime is testing the boundaries uh, of the opportunities and look how will a uh, democratic world react. So, okay, I hijacked an uh, airplane. So what will be the reaction? Uh, okay, the reaction was uh, strong maybe, but not enough. I will send uh, illegal immigrants to the borders of the country. Okay, what will be the reaction? So I think that it's high time for um, uh, democratic countries to unite uh, and show their teeth. And uh, as for people, as for usual people, 
every person can uh, contribute uh, in our revolution, our prize, and just uh, supporting people. First of all, and it's very important to send letters to political prisoners. It will take 10, 15 minutes of your life, but it will make the whole day for those who are behind the bars. It's so important for them to realize they are in informational vacuum, but they when get letters, uh, and letters from abroad, it inspires them that the whole world with us, we uh, 